know when you're really, really sick, you can be unaware of your sickness for maybe a minute or two. For the next 23 and a half hours, sickness shoves its face, you know, into your consciousness. Says, Remember, don't forget, you got cancer, you're going to die. You want to be happy, be happy, but make sure, you know, the sibling of happiness is right there. Sadness, sorrow, regret, grief. So you laugh and you shed some tears like a clown. You have a smiley face, you also, you know, cry at the same time. <clears throat> when you say ignorance is bliss, uh, it really exists for the most part for those who are forgetful and who live in the bosom or cradle of privilege. You know, and you have a culture, this one, that creates for you so much distraction. And add to the fact that America is young. It's about only about 200 years old. I mean, you can't ask a five-year-old to be serious, to be reflective. That's not what five-year-olds do. You know, after World War II, America became the superpower. You know, and once you have a good amount of power, what do you do? You create stuff, and people enjoy those stuff. You know, when 9-11 happened and the war broke out, or even the, yeah, uh, I was teaching at Sierra College, and people would get into their Hummers and drive to San Francisco. They would say, no oil for blood. Now, it takes about 150 bucks to of gas in your Hummer to take you to San Francisco and back, to Roseville, Rockland. Are you kidding? You should really appreciate the fact that America has the power to go all the way to Iraq, kill the people, exploit the land, get dual and bring it here. What would happen to American life if it was no oil? If you didn't have countries that you forced into submission, what would American life look like? What would you do if there was no dollar store? And you have dollar store because of China. And what would poor people in America do if there was no dollar store? What, they go to what, Neiman Marcus? So, the problem with your question, Shamal, is... Uh, Modern students, 21st century students, have physical life issues. They want to know they're great. They want money for their rent. They want love because their parents didn't give it to them. They suffer from loneliness, alienation, confusion. The fact that the culture is filled with stuff. It's like a balloon. It's big, it's huge, it's colorful. But when you pop it, there is nothing in it. Everybody wants to go with Kim Kardashian. <clears throat> they want to go out and have fun with it. Kim Kardashian, Brad Pitt. Have you guys ever watched Brad Pitt doing interviews? About like real stuff of life? He looks really good and he acts really good. But without a script, he's like a balloon popped. He's very, very, very slow. He's got no substance. And if he does, he can't express it well. For those of you who are interested, <clears throat> go online, go to YouTube, and in its search engine, look for the interview that was done with him and this Indian actor, Shah Rukh Khan. It took place some years ago. Shah Rukh Khan is... Anyways, um, and just watch the way that the Indian and the American respond to the, to the questions and how they offer perspectives. You know, when you listen to Brad Pitt give answers, it's like idiot's version, you know, like a cliff note. And it's indicative of just the culture itself. It's fast, it's furious. No one really has time to sit and reflect deeply about how things are and how things function and how to express yourself eloquently. And then listen to Shah Rukh Khan. He is an Indian. It's a 5,000 year tradition. It has roots deep into the earth. 
the moment you're born as an infant in India, you're rich in culture, in philosophy, in religion. You can't escape it. And then listen to the way he responds. It is rich. Now, the thing you need to understand about Rumi is this. <clears throat> Rumi is not physically lonely. Rumi does not seek attention because he's had it most of his life. Rumi has had a great father. He's had a great mother. He's got great grandparents, a great culture. Everything about his physical life is perfect. He's like 20-some. His father dies. He takes over the school. How many students does he have? 500. Every day he goes to the school and people look at him as a god. He's called Khodavandagar. Khaje, master, teacher, guru. When he meets Shams, he suffers not so much from physical poverty or intellectual poverty or emotional poverty. He now suffers from spiritual poverty. There was something about Shams that awakened something about Rumi. It wasn't money for rent. It wasn't going to school and getting a PhD. It wasn't about getting married or getting laid. None of those things. There was a different sense of hunger inside him. And so one of the things that I think it's important for people to do is, if, for example, you don't have parents in your life, don't go to India looking for like a spiritual teacher. Because it's, it's the wrong avenue for you. You know, go out there, find yourself a companion, will yourself <clears throat> to be open and to be willing to be hurt. You don't need spiritual practices. That's stupid. Just go into life, man. Be open if you can. Just allow people to trample all over you and for you to kind of just be okay with it and continue with the relationship. Once you have done the basics of life, then maybe you can graduate to, you know, looking for people like Shams. But until then, just go to what Idris said. Be quiet. Now, silence is an interesting phenomenon. Um, you know, you could keep your mouth shut, but your thoughts inside you are running wild. And your thoughts are running wild because you could have a lot of questions or you have too many negative emotions and you want to figure things out. And though on the outside you may be quiet, on the inside the volcano is erupting. When you're young, it's really, really bad to be quiet. Unless you're like an introvert and you're just like embarrassed, you know, to talk in public. That's a different story. But when you're young, you have no business being quiet, man. You got to go out there and ask a lot of questions so your mind can be seasoned. You can like figure things out. You got to be like Muhammad over there, you know. If you're interested in things and all young kids are, at least they used to be. Like this class. Every day I come to this class, so what do you guys want to talk about? 50 questions. It's like a war zone. Bullets are always flying here and there. Right? But when you get to be raised age, you just want to be left alone. There isn't really much new under the sun. You have asked a good amount of questions. You have heard a good amount of answers to your questions. You've read a few books. You've been in society, public life, and now you slowly, you know, there is nothing interesting out there. I had a student, uh, very much like Ray, he was very much engaged in political and social life. He would go you know, to places and give pamphlets to people about social justice and homelessness and all that stuff. Uh, he did that from the age 20 to about 56. <laughs> when he came to my class like 10, 15 years ago, he was so exhausted. And so whenever anybody in the class asked about social and political issues, he would say, please, please, can we not talk about that? Where are you going? I'll just ask a question. I'm just going to refresh myself.
Um, do you think that because a lot of the people in this class are here because they feel something when you come to class, give us a voice in some way or express it with words? Do you think that that really distracts from the message of what you're saying? No. You don't think so? Oh, no, no, no. See, it happens in stages. No, don't go. Just, just you ask the question. Let me give you the answer. You can't just like do a hit and run. Oh, you did? I can write you a note. Yeah, to your teacher. Please forgive him, Professor Sabzavari. Oh yeah, I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Write him a note. No, if you want to leave, leave. I'll just talk about your question and you can give me sure I can yeah just write the note I'll sign it yeah um, see it happens in stages imagine that you're going to Pete's coffee and on your way there you see me you don't know me we haven't yet spoken right but you feel an attraction that's the initial. Your initiation into this relationship begins with attraction. Now, you're not going to understand why you're attracted. You're just attracted. So what happens? As I'm walking to Pete and you're walking the opposite direction, you're going to turn around and follow me. In Oakland, of course, we call it stalking, but that's a different story. And then you tap me on my shoulder. In Oakland, I say, oh, he has a knife or a gun or something. No, I, I turn around and it's just this meek, nice young man. And he looks at me and he says, I'm attracted to you. And because I'm open and diverse, say, follow me to hell. We go to Pete's Coffee. Now, how old are you? How old am I? You're 20. I'm 60. There is no way in hell you're ever going to be able to understand me. Add to the fact that I come from a culture you have no idea of. You have no knowledge of. You have no interest in. So what is going to happen is I'm going to recite for you poetry. And God forbid, man, if the sun is setting and the power is out, and Pete's coffee has lit some candles. And then I say poetry to you in the dark candle lit space. Deed Musa yek shabani rabra ku hami gufte khuda wo e'la. You have no idea what's happening to you. You want to scream and shout. You're so joyous. You're so happy. You say, oh my God, his voice. What is he saying? You're not going to understand any of this stuff. You see those two people over there? <clears throat> Imagine they didn't speak Arabic. I don't speak Arabic, but once in a while I have this desire to hear the recitation of the Quran by Abdul Basit. Oh man, I don't speak the language. I don't even understand what the hell those people are talking about. Muhammad never liked them. What? Good job. Now, <clears throat> do I understand? No. But is the music, the recitation has the power to move me? Absolutely. You're not here to understand the message. You will never be able to understand the message. You're here to be inspired. That inspiration will move you. You'll go to Barnes and Nobles and read a couple of books. Let's just say you're going to pick up the dialogues of Plato. You will never understand it. But you will get your PhD in philosophy, you'll walk into the classroom, and you'll spit out the information. Not because you understand, but because you've been inspired. You want to understand something? Therapy. And therapy means you sit somewhere, you're pushed, you're poked, you're triggered. And you won't like what you see and what you feel. And you're going to be at it for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years until slowly you're able to decode stuff. Now you're initiated into understanding. 
Yeah. You think that inspiration? Yes. Is inspiration a form? <laughs> No, inspiration is just inspiration. Inspiration is like fuel to the engine. Without it, it can't go. The question is, if you have the inspiration, where is it going to go? In your case, whatever inspiration you have inside you, it's all going to vanish once you leave this class. Because you got other classes to go. You got to pay attention to your instructors. You got schoolwork. You got your own ambitions. You're sleeping with other people. I am monogamous. I want people to only be with me and no other. You take my inspiration, you trash it. For what? I have stats. No, actually. Allah Akbar! <laughs> no. Gonna get a heart attack in this class. <laughs> it actually really upsets me that I have to. Right I know. I, and I've, I've actually just, I don't know why I'm sharing this, but I've just decided to not go some days and just call it off my bills. Right? So. Yeah, if your parents are okay with that, and if your GPA is not going to be impacted at your school, and if your teachers can kind of overlook your transgressions, but above all, if your parents are okay, because I don't want your father knocking on my door. No with like a two pound Pete's coffee bag. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Mohammed. Uh, I wanted to ask again about Socrates and what language you read. Okay. There are no different Socrates. There is only one Socrates. Well, let me change that a little. Let me first tell you who Socrates is from his own mouth. Socrates is a gadfly. A gadfly is the following. You are a horse. Mohammed, you are a horse. Not a stallion, just a regular ugly horse. But Despite all of your deficiencies, you have two wings. Two wings. One on your left, one on your right. The wings that you used to have when you were a child, jumping on sofas, asking your parents, why don't the stars fall? Playing with yourself innocently, naively having no shame, no guilt. You lived in the Garden of Eden. You could go anywhere, do anything. And your parents always forgave you. At least tried to. Then, like the rest of us, you had no choice but to enter the kingdom of civilization. The do's and don'ts, moral codes, rights and wrongs. Little by little, the wings that you had are now clipped not entirely, though. Now, you want to write essays with a good amount of inspiration, but you're going to earn an AF. You need MLA, BLA. You need to talk about the things that I want you to talk about. And after a while, you just forget that you used to run wild, you used to be naked with no shame, no guilt, no remorse. Talk to anyone. Color didn't matter. You would just say hello to everybody. And you would share everything that you had with anybody, everybody. And then society came in and contaminated you. And then you run into a Socrates. Socrates is a gadfly. A tiny little fly, insect. But the thing about this particular insect is that it has teeth. Fangs. Each tooth is about like a mile long. Now Socrates will sit on you. What do horses do when horses do when they have a fly on them? They're going to move their tail. They're going to smack the hell out of those insects. 
So first of all, Socrates needs to sit on you. And you will try to get rid of him, but he must like you enough to continue to sit on you. And after a while, you just kind of just give up. And then without any warning, he puts his fangs into your skin. And you say, oh. And with that first ow, oh, you feel something. You feel something that you had forgotten. You feel some air under your wings. And you get a tiny little glimpse of your wing. You say, oh, what the hell is this? Where'd they come from? They're always there. But society had made you blind. Obligations, responsibilities. You try to get rid of Socrates. But he's got his fangs in you, man. Now you have conflict. Should I push him out or should I just let him do what he does? You try to get rid of him, but you feel guilty because it felt so good. The pain felt so good. We are the sort of animals that don't enjoy pain. And yet now, for some strange reason, you like pain. Despite all the difficulties it creates, it becomes very enjoyable. But then as you're minding your own business, he puts his fang deeper inside your meat. And then he say, oh, now your wings all come out, but you're still walking. It's been a long time since you've flown. You don't even know what that means. And then you say, are you kidding? Are you telling me that comfort keeps me grounded, but pain inspires me to fly? Is that what pain does? Now, you know what happens. The conflict grows, the doubt grows, the fear grows. You try to tell people you got wings and you say, oh, honey, listen. Just graduate. You know, don't be so creative in your classes. Don't ask foolish questions. Don't piss off your instructors. Say, Mom, I'm creative. I'm inspired. Oh, no, no. That, that's not for college, love. And you realize other people don't understand you, especially those closest to you. Then now that Socrates knows that Despite all the pain he creates, you're going to keep him around. He pushes the fangs deeper into your meat. And for the first time, you see yourself flying. And as you fly, you look down, you say, oh my God, life is so small. Social life. And Socrates, because he's a reflective, compassionate man, looks at you and says, listen, Muhammad, you sure you want to do this? Because I can just go. I can just fly away. You say, you know, I don't know what this pain is, but I like it. It's making my life difficult because I'm not disconnected from my parents, from my siblings, from my friends. School used to be fun, but no longer is. Smoking used to be fun, and no longer is. I used to be fun, I no longer am. Can you just bite me some more? And Socrates looks at him and says, yes, I'll bite you. And he keeps biting you and biting you and biting you. And as the pains increase, you fly higher and higher and higher. What happens when you fly higher and higher? You get close to what? You get close to the clouds. Then you get close to the sun. Now, for the first time, you understand what heat really is, what burning really is, what the sun really is. Now you live in the light. You're no longer this horse we call Pegasus. You become Icarus. And anyone who has been to the sun has no choice but to become a Messiah. You come down and you take a shape of a man, a mortal. Now that is what Socrates is. But there are different versions you can find in philosophy classes. Socrates was a Greek philosopher. He was born in Athens. 
225. He had a student named Plato. He has a thing called the dialectic method, Socratic method. On Wednesday, we'll have a quiz about Socrates. That's another version of presenting Socrates. And you raise your hand and you look at your instructor and say, I thought Socrates was supposed to be, you know, stinging me. I feel no sting except the sting of having a quiz on Wednesday or Thursday. Are you sure this is what philosophy is? And your instructor who has a PhD from Harvard says, yes. Socrates about facts and figures and dates. Now, no, no, they're all the same. Why? They're all the same. You don't get a different Socrates in India as you do in America or Persia. It doesn't work that way. Gadflies all function the same way. It's only those who have never been gadflied. Why, thank you. Okay? Only those who have never been stung who will offer you a very watered down version of who Socrates is. And there are thousands of them. Go today. Go to Google and type Socrates and read every goddamn article out there. You will never feel anything, but you will collect some data that you can put on your essays. And that will always be a different color, a different shade. We call it diversity. And it's subjective. The real Socrates, he is the only, he only creates the sort of pain that takes you to wisdom. And you know what pain is, right? It's something that your intellect can come down and fix it. Socrates is a man who paralyzes your thinking abilities. He intensifies the way you feel. And you want to manage the way you feel with your reflections. It won't happen. And you have to live in darkness for a long, long, long time before you're able to gain control over yourself, your emotions, and your thoughts. And once you become mature, you put your emotions and your thoughts in expression. You either do poetry, you do music, you do philosophy, or you become a parent. Or you help the homeless. Yeah, yeah. It's to Idris. It's Idris, right? Idris. Idris. Um, I had this question. Not really related, but for some reason. Like, I think that expressing yourself publicly, like from a question or a comment, is in a way a mistake. No. Can I finish what I no, no, let me, no, I, no I, you can't. Look. I mean, you can. It depends, first of all, on your temperament, your background, how you've been wired. But for the most part, how it usually works is today. I'm not talking about like many, many years ago where women did not sleep around or men did not sleep around until marriage. That tradition protected certain aspects of human life. Imagine... Expressing yourself is like having sex. In other words, you have certain passions inside you, and you want to share those passions. And you just go around, and you just spread your passions everywhere. You're like the real Don Juan. Okay? Now, there comes a point, and this is what happens to women mostly, not men. It takes men a long, long time. A woman happens to be in a relationship, or many relationships. They come to realize that it's not working out for them. They're looking for someone who is mature. There's someone looking for someone who's educated. Not so much like educated in the sense of going to school, but knows how to think well, be responsible. And they say, I'm not going to just date casually. When I do date, it'll be like an interview. I want to know if this person can be my future partner, the father to my child, okay? Expression is very much like that. That's why we have cults, underground movements. You give something to the public, okay? Then out of the 20 people you give to, five show interest. Out of the five who show interest, 
one becomes a student, that one student becomes your devoted disciple. To that person, you express the things you don't express to the public. You have sex with the person who is going to be your com lifelong companion. But that takes a while for you to get to. If you're talking about Idris's question about silence, let me just end the class with this poem. Um, I'll probably butcher it. چون دایره ما ز پوس پوشان تویم در دایره حلقه به گوشان تویم گر بن وازی ز جان خروشان تویم ورنن وازی هم از خموشان تویم If you're like a Socrates, if someone asks you a question, you will only answer if the gods come down and inspire you. That's the only time you will speak. You don't want to speak because you want to inflate your ego. You don't want to speak because you want to show off. You don't want to speak because you're lonely and pathetic and you want attention. No. Chun daire ma ze pus pushan tuim. Daire is like this drum. Dar daire halqa be gushan tuim. We're always waiting to be picked up. Gar ben vazi ze jan khurushan tuim. If you pick me up and slap the skin I will make sound. I will make people move. If on the other hand, you don't pick me up, you don't pay me attention, it's okay, I will remain invisible. I will remain silent. But it takes a long time for any of us to get to that maturity. That you will only move when you're inspired. You will only take classes that inspire you. You will only write moments of inspiration. You will only read books that will inspire you. And your circle will begin to shrink enormously because there are not very many things out there that can inspire you the right way. Ray? Sure. It's uh, good to see all of you. Have a nice weekend. Have a good time with your parents. <laughs> yeah, take your mom's car, fill it up with gas. Go shopping. You know, Safeway, get them 